All right, well, it's slightly after 5.30. We have a pretty packed full agenda to get through tonight and a lot of good information. So I'm gonna go ahead and jump in. Again, feel free to keep introducing yourselves in the chat, say where you're logging in from. Um, but first and foremost, thank you for joining us tonight for elections. We're talking the past, the historical references, the present and what we might expect in the future. So some of that magic eight ball type of stuff. Today I calculated we are 63 days away from the presidential election. So I don't know how many of you woke up and were like, whoa, it's September. Um, but having that September moment and that 63 days away moment really was a little mind boggling. Um, but I think this will be a great way to kick off September and kind of that road to the election. Also understand that these are challenging times for many. And so we're happy to have you join us tonight and hope this is just a really fun and informative webinar Feel free to make yourselves comfortable, pop questions in the chat, chat with one another. Because we have a lot of information to get through, we won't address questions until the very end. You can certainly pop them in the chat and I'll keep track of them, or you can hold on to them till the end and then we'll address them then. I just want to quickly thank our Alumni Association members, as well as the College of Liberal Arts. Um, so your membership really does make events like this possible. It's because of our members that we can put on events like this and because of the expertise of the Department of Political Science and the Department of History tonight that we get to have some of these fun conversations. Um, in a moment, I will add to the chat a helpful article in case you're having any problems with technology. Feel free to reach out to me if you're having issues with sound, connection, all of that. Um, but otherwise, continue to just use the chat to connect with with that, I know you didn't come here to hear from me, so I'm going to turn it over to our experts. I want to quickly introduce them, um, and then I'm going to really let them take it away tonight. We're going to talk with Dr. Robert Gudenstead, which is who is the chair and professor in the Department of History. He, his research interests include the Civil War, which for those of you who don't know, I didn't know, is the most contentious war, or er, was the most contentious election in American history. So I think he'll have some really, really great insights to add, um, as well as Dr. Matthew Hitt and Dr. Kyle Sanders, who study American political institutions, American politics, political parties, political behavior, and public opinion. So I think between that history perspective and that political science perspective, we have a really, really exciting road ahead of us. I know we just have an hour, so they're going to give us quick, insightful 10 or so minutes into each of their research interests, and then we're going to hear from New Era Colorado. For those of you who aren't familiar with New Era Colorado, they are our campus voting partners. They're nonpartisan, and they're just going to give a quick snippet on how you can register to vote, how you can update your voter registration, what may have changed in this virtual world. Um, and then we're turning it over to you all. Ask questions. They really are the experts. They're ready to address them. Um, but with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Robert Gudmustad and um, let him talk a little bit about the history and what we can learn from a polarized path. Thanks. Uh, um, what I want to say first is what history is and what history isn't. So a lot of people think that history is the past and everything that happened in the past. And that's not completely accurate. History is an interpretation of the past. It's a way of understanding events that happened 10 years ago, 100 years ago, 150 years ago. And so with that in mind, what I'm telling you is a way to understand the 1860 election. I think it's a very reasonable explanation. Um, and what I'm going to do is talk about the election itself and then talk about maybe some lessons for 2020 because I sometimes get asked, is there going to be another civil war? So, you know, as Alexandra alluded to, 1860, you could argue, was the most contentious election in United States history. Um, it was a very, very interesting election as well. Uh, you had four major candidates running for president. You had Abraham Lincoln, uh, who was the Republican candidate. Then you had the Democrats who couldn't make up their mind. Like, I guess that's kind of true today in some ways. And so they had two major candidates. Uh, one of them was Stephen Douglas, who Abraham Lincoln had debated in the very famous Lincoln-Douglas debates a few years earlier. And then the other candidate uh, for the Democrats was John Breckinridge. And you had one candidate 
who was basically a northerner and representing sort of northern interests. And the other, Breckenridge, was a southerner. And by the way, the, uh, the town of Breckenridge, Colorado, actually changed the spelling of the town name after John Breckenridge was nominated. They changed it uh, from an I to an E. And then you also had uh, John Bell uh, from Tennessee, who was trying to cobble together this coalition of centrists. And he formed what he called the Constitutional Union Party. So you have these, you have these four major candidates, and these are all well-known politicians in the United States. And campaigning was very different back then than it is today. Um, it, it was more like a COVID era uh, in, in the sense that politicians really did not go out on the campaign trail. Uh, Abraham Lincoln was not forcefully campaigning for president. He, he had given some speeches, um, but mostly you had, they called them surrogates who were, who were doing the campaign, campaigning, other Republicans. And of course, newspapers were very partisan back then. So you had literally Republican newspapers and, and Democratic newspapers, and they would publish their candidate's opinion and, and tear down the other side. Again, not that much different from um, Fox News and MSNBC, who have very partisan takes on, on current events. Um, the election um, was interesting in the sense that um, Abraham Lincoln was not even on the ballot in most of the states of the Deep South. So if you lived in Louisiana, for instance, you had no, you, no chance to vote for, for Lincoln. Uh, but Lincoln, as you know, I hope, uh, did win the election of 1860. However, uh, his share of the popular vote was 39% which is the second lowest total for any winning candidate in American history. 39%, that's, that's pretty low um, in some ways. Uh, but he won the electoral vote in large part because Northern states had uh, more electoral votes than, than a lot of the Southern states, and Southerners kind of split their votes as well. Um, and then soon after Lincoln's election, uh, obviously that was in November of 1860, in December, of 1860, South Carolina became the first state um, to secede or de to declare separation from the Union or the United States. Uh, six other states followed, so by the time Lincoln uh, was inaugurated in April, uh, that's different, we now inaugurate the president in, in December, um, seven states had seceded, and then a total of 11 states um, seceded by the time um, that the war um, actually became a shooting. Well, soon after the war became a shooting war with Fort Sumter, you have 11 states seceding. All right, that's the, that's the really, really quick version of the election of 1860. So the question is, okay, is 2020 like 1860? Are we gonna be facing a civil war? And the short answer is no. And I could stop there, but I'm a historian, so we keep talking. Um, a few things about um, 1860 compared to 2020. There was a really, really long trail of partisanship in the United States, um, particularly beginning in the 1830s and into the 1840s and 50s. There was violence in the House of Representatives and the House of, uh, uh, excuse me, in the Senate. Um, there was punching, slapping, caning, shoving, even dueling. Um, on one occasion, there was a wild scramble in the House where one man lost his toupee in the fisticuffs. Um, in the Senate, uh, you had uh, historians um, famously point to the, the Benton Foot fiasco um, where one senator began charging after another one and he was a large burly man like he was going to wring the other guy's neck so the guy, other guy pulls out a pistol and then finally the, you know they, they stop that. Um, there was the very famous caning of, of Charles Sumner in the Senate as well um, <laughs> where Sumner had given a speech that was insulting to a particular senator then that senator's kinsman, as he called himself, uh, sort of barricaded Sumner behind his desk and started beating with the cane um, until he was unconscious and, and lying on the floor, while another senator stood there brandishing a gun, keeping everybody away. There was also, very famously, a duel in which um, a, House of, a member of the House of Representatives was killed. Uh, this was in 1838, um, and it has a really strange name. The, the, the member from Maine, um, his name was spelled C-I-L-L-E-Y, which I think is pronounced silly. Not a great name for a politician. Um, and he was fighting Graves, so it became the Silly Graves duel, 
which is a, a weird name, but they were 90 yards apart and they were using rifles with one another. Um, and eventually um, uh, Graves killed Silly on the third round, shot him in the abdomen and, and then he died. Um, so anyway, there was this long trail of partisanship for 30 years. Yes, we have partisanship and yes, we've been divided, but we haven't been that divided, I would argue at least. I think another reason why uh, 2020 is very different from 1860 is that slavery was the all-encompassing issue of 1860. And the bottom line is slavery was the primary and most significant cause of the American Civil War. Without the presence of slavery, you do not have a civil war in the United States, I would argue. Slavery was political, it was economic, it was racial, it was social and cultural. Um, and many people voted on this single issue because it was so important. I don't see an issue today that is so prominent. You know, immigration, I don't think rises, you know, or, you know, building a border wall really doesn't rise to that occasion. Um, uh, you know, other, other issues like Black Lives Matter and police brutality, that doesn't rise to, to that level. Also in 1860, you had a clear geographical division in the United States primarily between the slave states and what were known as the free states, so those states that didn't have slavery. Now there's a little bit of um, uh, wiggle room there because not every state that had slavery joined the Confederacy, but for the most part, um, the, the states with a higher percentage of slaves were more committed to the Confederacy, they're more passionate about it. Um, you don't have that clear geographical divide in the United States today. You might say that there's an urban rural divide, but that's not the same as kind of uh, this Mason Dixon line divide as well. And then finally, um, there was a clear and persistent and organized effort to um, have secession or to create secession or to convince people about the, the goodness of secession. Uh, and it was around for at least a decade prior to the American Civil War. Uh, you had a group of politicians in the South who were passionately devoted to slavery. Um, they became known as the fire eaters uh, and they were agitating for slavery as early as um, the 1840s. And even in, the, in 1850, there was a, something called the Nashville Convention where they sort of tried to, to lead, the, lead a group of states out of the United States and, and create a separate country. And so over at least a decade, they're agitating for separation. I don't see that same type of movement in the contemporary United States, where you have this really organized and vocal, and I would argue potent group that's agitating um, for, for um, secession in the United States. You know, so the election of Lincoln did not cause secession, and it did not cause the Civil War, it was kind of the culminating event of things that were in place for years and for decades that were building over time. And it was sort of this political system that gets overloaded with an issue that it couldn't figure out. And then finally, it just burst apart. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to Matt. Great, thank you, Robert. Um, and Kyle, do you mind if I just give you a, a high sign or yep. something like that to advance? Okay. Yeah. Um, well, uh, let's I, make sure it works. Okay. It's we right. Cool. Yep. All right. Welcome, everybody. Yeah. Um, I'm Matthew Hitz. So I my research focus is on the governing institutions of American politics, and so that's what I'm here to talk about right now in terms of where we stand in terms of our government's ability to function or not, and to bridge into the main theme of the night. What I really want to emphasize is that because of the nature of America's form of government, elections matter, obviously, for two critical reasons when we think about our governing institutions. So one is the easy one, right? This is, uh, you know, this will be on the quiz and you'll all get this right. Elections matter for the composition of our governing institutions, Congress and the presidency, of course. Uh, but also elections matter for the composition of our unelected institutions, most notably the federal judiciary and the U.S. Supreme Court, because we appoint our judges through the elected branches. So the preferences of voters who create the composition of our governing institutions also create our unelected institutions in a roundabout fashion. Uh, so that's pretty obvious, right? That elections create 
the institution by sending folks there who win elections and do stuff. But also elections fundamentally shape the incentives of the people who run our governing institutions. And that's gonna be a focus of what I'd like to talk about for the next few minutes here. So move on to the first thing here. I tried, there we go. Oh, beautiful, thank you, Kyle. Uh, so we are in a crisis of governance right now. Um, and that crisis is precipitated by the thing that, uh, if you're hoping for COVID escapism tonight, I'm sorry, we won't go <laughs> too far down this road. But, uh, the reality is the COVID-19 pandemic and America's response to it have created uh, a massive national crisis through which we are very much still living. In response to this crisis, and you know, in COVID-19 terms, this was 60, maybe 70 years ago, but it was actually just in April that Congress passed a $2 trillion plus relief bill. Uh, some of you may have gotten checks from the federal government uh, as part of that stimulus. Uh, anyone receiving unemployment benefits would have gotten an extra $600 a week. State and local governments got hundreds of millions of dollars. Healthcare organizations got hundreds of millions of dollars. It was, it was billions and billions and two, up to the $2 trillion mark that we spent trying to respond to the pandemic and its economic consequences. To put this in perspective for y'all, to remember the Great Recession of 2008, right, uh, around the transition between George Bush and Barack Obama, the COVID-19 relief bill that President Trump signed was more than double, uh, sorry, it was larger than the TARP Act that President Bush signed to res rescue financial institutions and Barack Obama's stimulus program put together. This one COVID-19 relief bill uh, eclipsed that by almost uh, half a trillion dollars. So we spent all this money, uh, we did all these things. The economy is showing some signs of life maybe, the pandemic very much still going, unemployment remains over 10%, and crucially, that $600 a week in unemployment benefits uh, is gone. And that's you know for people who are still unemployed because their business closed or they were laid off or furloughed, whatever it might be, uh, they might be hurting right now. So among many other things, this is what we're dealing with right now going into the fall election cycle. Notably, the House of Representatives passed another gigantic relief act in May, you may have noticed that. Uh, the Senate is, it's, you know, remembering how things work, the Senate has to take something up now. They've adjourned, they won't be back for a while, and there's no indication that I've seen that we're likely to see a vote happening anytime soon. So why is that? Why is this crisis of governance being met by a meh, more or less? So a point that I love to emphasize to my students, and I, I blame many, uh, reasonable and smart political commentators and journalists for, do, for doing this and making my job harder. Congress is not an it. Congress is a they, okay? Congress is a collection of individual politicians who all act according to their own individual incentives. And in combination, that can lead to some dysfunction and failures of governance like the ones we're seeing today. So uh, to give a brief example, it's obvious that passing the second enormous relief bill was something that suited the prerogatives and the preferences of Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, and her liberal uh, Democratic Party colleagues in the House. They sent that bill over to the Senate. The Senate, uh, controlled of course today by the Republican Party, uh, it currently has an internal disagreement effectively about what to do uh, with the ongoing pandemic and economic crisis. Uh, and because there is not a policy solution that a majority of Republicans in the Senate seem to be able to agree on. There's not going to be legislation brought forward in the Senate that a minority of Republicans and all the Democrats could potentially override a majority of the Republicans on. I don't see that happening. And that's, we have this failure of response and you could respond to a pandemic in lots of different ways, right? There are liberal and conservative ways to do this. Um, but some people who would say, well, there was something, the economy ticked up a little bit, maybe there's some things we were doing that working, some things that were too much, too expensive, not enough, whatever. Now we're not doing anything um, or anything more. And so as we move forward here, uh, it's worth exploring why that might be. It seems like part of what's happening, talking again about those individual incentives and how elections are shaping uh, the behavior and the st strategy that's being employed by individuals who make up Congress, it does seem like 
Republicans in the Senate might be anticipating, and Kyle, you know, can correct me if said, oh, their anticipation is way off or way on, that there was likely to be div divided or minority government for the Republican Party uh, after 2020. Who knows? You know, it's September, November, still a long-ish way away. But if Biden wins, for example, uh, you would see sort of a similar dynamic potentially to what happened right after Barack Obama took the presidency in 2009, where there's big, bold policy proposals. We've got to respond to a gigantic economic crisis. Uh, and if, and this is a big if, if the Democratic Party controls both, has a majority in both houses of Congress and Biden wins the presidency, some things will probably get done. Um, will they make all the progressive liberals happy? No. Will they make conservative Republicans happy? No, definitely not, right? Uh, people will not. So these aren't, you know, it's not like the, you know, if you uh, favor, favor Democrats, um, you know, it's not as if uh, you're gonna get an entire wish list. And if you're a conservative Republican, um, it's, it's not realistic to think that major gigantic sweeping liberal progressive policy changes are all going to happen right away after an election. And that's in large part because of the way the Senate does its business, right? The Senate operates under effectively a supermajority rule that most pieces of ordinary legislation have to get not 51, that is a bare majority, but 60 votes. They have to pass a filibuster threshold. And it, it's not clear to me that there is an appetite among uh, all of the Democrats in the Senate, um, or even potentially, you know, Joe Biden himself to actually change filibuster rules. So if you don't change filibuster rules, anything the Senate uh, would approve is going to have to have the acquiescence of a, uh, a Republican Party in the minority. And this works as a governing strategy for the minority party. And both parties can certainly can and have done some of this obstruction, obstructionist kind of techniques because co uh, Congress in the media, Congress in a lot of the public mind is thought of as an it. Congress didn't do anything. They failed. Let's send some new bums to Congress because the old bums didn't do any good. So the minority party benefits from the perception of inefficacy, right? Because we, we talk about Congress. Why didn't Congress pass something to do with COVID-19? Well, part of Congress did. And another part of Congress is not going to, it seems very likely. Um, and if you don't like that, it's easier to blame the it of Congress than to sort of parse out, well, which party and which member did what and how? And most folks um, probably are not spending as much time in the weeds as political scientists and historians are, you know, thinking about these sorts of things. So moving on. Uh, so, sorry. Oh, sorry, yeah, just one, and one last point on this, I'll, I'll go quick on this. Um, so the, the effective point here, so, don't we always talk about, well, gee whiz, why can't Congress just roll up their sleeves and get stuff done? Because folks don't actually vote for that, right? The, the notion of compromise, the notion of compromise, um, the notion of, yes, we should do things in a bipartisan fashion, solve problems. People who engage in politics and particularly people who vote in primary elections in this country, partisan primaries don't like that, right? Uh, the perception of you made a deal with the other uh, political team can actually hurt longstanding incumbents in Congress. And so, again, sort of tying this all together here, individual members, because Congress is a they, not an it, if you get nothing else out of this, okay? Uh, from me, you'll get a lot more from, <laughs> from Robert and Kyle. If you get nothing else from me, Congress is a they, not an it. The they's, enjoy very high re-election rates and reasonably-ish high approval ratings individually from their constituents. Because Nancy Pelosi, by passing a big, expansive, centralized stimulus package, uh, is serving the preferences of her constituents, serving the preferences of her party caucus, and Senator Mitch McConnell is doing the same thing, right, just on the other side of the coin. So in combination, from the, perspective, uh, from the perspective of the folks who are running this, um, why fix it? Why should the Democratic Party come down on its demand for $600 a week going forward, right? That's what we want. And, you know, we're, we will suffer if we're seen to be compromising with the Republicans. 
And if you're a Republican, well, why should we go up to $500, $600 a week for unemployment insurance? We don't want to be compromising with the Democrats and voting for big government. So in combination, you get this functioning gridlock. And at the individual level, for a lot of folks, things are working well-ish, well-ish enough that people don't have an incentive to change their behavior. All right, so the last point tying in the other, uh, yeah, we can move on, Kyle. Right. Thank you. Tying yeah. in the other institution I study, which is the US Supreme Court. Um, yeah, I know I've, I'm probably running long, so I'll just say uh, this election matters tremendously for the Supreme Court. <laughs> um, the Supreme Court, right now, if you look at the ideological balance, sort of what sort of legal policies the justices tend to support, we are on a knife edge five to four conservative versus liberal split. And so many very contentious cases come essentially down to what John Roberts think, thinks the Constitution says. Uh, that's where we're at on a lot of stuff today. And uh, Chief Justice Roberts, the new swing justice, he basically uh, has managed to make people of all ideological stripes mad at least once this year, which is a good thing or a bad thing, depending on how you view him. Um, yeah. Oh, Amanda has a great question here. Shouldn't they be doing that? That's what their constituents want over everything else. Yes, totally. But if we draw, for example, the district lines in the House of Representatives so that most of the people here in the second district of Colorado, you know, maybe 60-ish percent of the voters tend to vote for Democrats and liberals, um, compromising with conservatives is going to hurt a representative here. So by upholding gridlock and not compromising, not giving ideological ground on major policies, that's what the public servants are doing for the folks who vote for them. This is a harder trick for senators to pull off. Um, but we do see that senators tend to, uh, and the members of Congress tend to pay more attention to their own partisans, right? There, there is still the fear of that primary election that comes up. Um, and so, yeah, we could, we could go down that rabbit hole a long way. Uh, but Amanda, thank you for that question. Um, that was great. So, um, so, because it, so back to the Supreme Court, because of this ideological uh, knife edge divide, the justices themselves are, we, we can tell, don't want to retire, don't want to give up their seat if they think someone on the other side of the ideological aisle is going to get appointed to replace them. Like Clarence Thomas, you can see the most conservative justice right now is estimated uh, by some uh, right political scientists here. If Joe Biden wins and Democrats control the Senate, someone like Clarence Thomas is going to think, I don't want a Democrat appointing my replacement. We saw Anthony Kennedy wait until right after Donald Trump was elected to retire so that a Republican could fill his seat. Similarly, uh, if we go to the last slide here that I've got, Ruth Bader Ginsburg uh, and Stephen Breyer, both appointed by Democrats, tend to be liberal. Um, you know, the notorious RBG, right? If you're on a, if you spent your Tuesday night on a politics webinar with some academics, you've probably, you know, you've probably heard about her and have an opinion about her. They're both over 80. Clarence Thomas himself is 72. Um, I bet a case of my favorite local VR. So we had a Californian who misses Fort Collins. I hope you can get Odell IPA out there if that uh, happens to be your preference. Uh, I, I'll bet you a case that one or more of those three justices is going to retire in the next four years. Which one uh, voluntarily retires is probably going to be a function of who wins this election. And if one of them uh, retires and it's not voluntary, um, which is the nice academic way of saying, you know, um, natural causes. Uh, don't want to be too grim, right? It's a lighthearted night. Uh, those are the kind of random natural shocks that if the presidency and the Senate line up with the same party can dramatically change uh, the direction ideologically of the U.S. Supreme Court. So if you care about what the Supreme Court does, about what kinds of issues it happens to deal with, uh, this is why senatorial elections matter, right? The election in 2014, turnout was under 40 percent. Uh, one party, the Republicans, picked up nine seats in the Senate. You had as a result, a Supreme Court seat that was left open for almost a year awaiting the 2016 election that was ultimately filled not by Democrat Barack Obama, but by Republican Donald Trump. So elections matter. So boy, wouldn't it be great if we had a renowned national expert in American politics, partisanship, and polarization about to uh, take the mic and tell us uh, what to expect here in 2020. Tell us what he doesn't know. Uh, hello, everyone. Good evening. Um, so I'm going to start these um, remarks by note, pointing you to the parenthetical underneath the title. Um, this is what we know today. 
uh, this is going to change um, elections, especially with 63 days left to go, are notoriously dynamic, but I think in COVID world and everything that's going on, I think we can expect a dynamic, if not tumultuous, uh, next 63 days. So this is, my, this is my best set of guesses and the best set of data that I can bring to you as of today. Um, so I want to start off with the presidential election, and obviously we have um, a, an incumbent president, uh, President Trump, who is, uh, and I'll show you the, his uh, approval ratings in just a moment, um, but one of the things I want to point out is most of the people who are experts on this would point to the status of the economy and the approval rating of the sitting president as the two biggest factors as to what predicts whether or not a president will be reelected as well as how much they will be reelected by. That's what the elect election experts would tell us. And President Trump is, has been relatively unpopular for the entirety of his presidency, but it's been a stable amount of unpopular. And that level of unpopularity would usually be an anchor. But there's a bit of nuance to that because there are places where that unpopularity will matter and there are places in other states where that will not matter, especially with regard to down ballot races. Um, so here in Colorado, I, I would argue that Trump is a, is a very massive factor um, with regard to the electorate here as in, in our Senate race and, and as well as even one of the competitive House races that we have going on. Um, uh, and so when we think about this, let me point you to the, this is, this is just a year's worth of approval ratings. And you can see, while there is some volatility to it, um, it doesn't move all that much. I mean, those averages, it averages about 44% approval rating across the entirety of that year. Um, there's a high point there of maybe 47% um, and a low point of 42, so 41 so it it does vary, but these this is I put this up here to be to show you that approval as well as partisanship on this has been relatively stable with regard to President Trump. Um, Republicans continue to endorse Trump and and talk about him in whoops, I didn't do that. Thank you. Um, they continue to um, support him at about 80 to 85 percent of Republicans continue to show uh, strong support for President Trump, that they're going to vote for him again in the next election. Where he hasn't performed all that well necessarily is in the uh, among independents. And we'll get to that in just a second. Um, next one, if you've got it. Alex. And we'll let me go. Um, Matt mentioned a couple of things uh, the, the, with regard to just the electoral context. The economy, while it did have a very, very bad second quarter, has shown some improvement. The stock market continues to look better um, each day, if that's one of the metrics that you look at um, to assess the economy. Unemployment is still high, much higher than it was during the Obama presidency, but it is improving somewhat. Um, there's also a lot of questions about the president's handling of the COVID um, coronavirus. So how all that has gone into the assessment of people with regard to individual level behavior as to how they're going to vote is, is a real question. I think also another part of this is to both Robert and Matthew, Matt talked about um, what issues matter in this electoral context. And if we go to the next slide, um, we'll see that, so the, the panel on the left, these are both data from Pew. This is the issue, these are, people were given a list of issues and asked which issues they regarded as very important. And it's no surprise, especially in a tumultuous economic time, that the economy is the number one issue. Um, the, uh, the healthcare Supreme Court appointments to Matt's point about the, that being a very important thing that people assess their electoral choices on. Um, the coronavirus is number four, uh, violent crime, foreign policy, gun policy, et cetera. And it goes down from there. Um, now, the data on the right are the same data, but broken up by vote choice. And what I want to point you to is that there are, there are issues where there are big spreads and there are issues where there are small spreads. And 
what I would point you to is the Trump supporters are thinking more about the economy. They're thinking much less about health care. Notice that spread, that inverse spread, right? Trump supporters are 48, Biden supporters are 84. Um, Trump supporters are thinking much less about the coronavirus than Biden supporters are. Um, Trump supporters are thinking a lot more about violent crime than Bi Biden supporters are. Um, Trump supporters are thinking more about immigration than Biden supporters are. Biden supporters are thinking much more about climate change, economic inequality, and racial inequality. So these are not surprising to anybody who thinks about partisan coalitions, but these are the things that, these are the issues that these candidates are going to be running on on the commercials that you're about to be deluged with. And they're, the, they're, they're what you're going to see every night at 5.30. It's just going to keep coming over and over and over again. And they're going to try to persuade the smaller number of persuadable voters that there are out there. We've seen over the last 20 years, we've seen the number of persuadable voters or the number of people who are willing to split their tickets between you know, a presidential candidate for a Republican and a, a, Senate, Demo a Senate for a Democrat right, where they would split, vote for a different party. Those people don't exist that much anymore. And so that, that changes the electoral context. This is much more a team polarized sport where you're trying to mobilize your side. And each one of these candidates are not really going to be trying to engage in much persuasion. They're going to be trying to gin up their supporters and try to create negative impressions of their opponent. I mean, that's a typical campaign strategy, but it's going to be even more exacerbated this time around. Um, next one. So how does that play into the Electoral College? And with regard to the presidential election, obviously, if we're decided by, it's decided by an archaic system called the Electoral College that I could spend the entire talk on, but I won't spend that much time on other than to say that there are 538 electoral votes based on basically population throughout the United States, except not really. And uh, most of those of those based on 435 congressional districts, 100 Senate seats, and the three seats from the, the District of Columbia. Okay, moving on. That's my stump speech for that. Uh, the, when we look at a map, and there are many representations of this map out there with regard to how, what, what the status of each state is with regard to its propensity in this election cycle. Um, I would point you to the yellow states on this map um, as the ones that have not been decided quite yet, um, the ones that are competitive, the ones that are toss-ups, however you want to think about it, where there's a lot of focus. That Notice that Colorado is not one of those. In fact, we're not even considered a leaning state anymore. We're considered a likely democratic state. So there won't be a lot of ad spending here. So those ads that I mentioned at TV time, they won't be, there won't be as many of those for you. But there will be in Wisconsin, Arizona, North Carolina, Florida, and Nebraska too. By the way, the reason Nebraska too is split out there is because Nebraska and Maine are the two states that split out their, congress their electoral college votes based on congressional districts. So Nebraska one and Nebraska three are very conservative districts. Nebraska two is actually somewhat competitive. Um, notice that if all of those yellow states uh, were to go to Trump, if you do your math down there at the bottom of the screen, it would be Republicans 270, Democrats 268. Um, if Nebraska too decided to go blue, it would be 269, 269. Now that is a one of those scenarios that is, uh, you know, a political scientist's uh, you know, exploding brain, but it, it basically goes to the House of Representatives and each state gets one vote. Um, which means Republicans would probably win because uh, Republicans have more states geographically. Um, so that's where we are. And it, so it, it, is, it is a competitive election. Um, next one, if you would, please. Um, but that's not to say that it's that close. Um, from most of the polling that's out there, President Biden is actually, or sorry, poof, candidate Biden is quite a, quite a bit ahead um, with regard to the popular vote. If you, there are various polling aggregators that have him up, Biden up five to six points uh, nationally. But national polls don't matter much when you're talking about an electoral college. It comes down to states and polling inside particular states matters, especially so. One of the graphics I like to use here is, is what I call the snake graph, where, which is just an illustration of those same yellow competitive states, but helping you think about how tenuous a, a presidential election can be 
with regard to if a few states go one way or another, and this is basically ranked by competitiveness of that state. So Arizona, Nebraska too, Florida, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Minnesota, those are all light Biden supporting states at the moment based on, based on polling. But they are very close. They are within 55, 60% probability to go to Biden. Uh, next one, please. And so, um, next one actually. And so one of the things I wanna talk about here is that this is a probabilistic situation. And for any of you who were following the election in 2016 and following the various pundit classes that were out there, there were a bunch of people who were saying that it was a sure thing for Hillary Clinton, um, but they weren't necessarily assessing this probabilistically or in a modeling sense or a, 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 a way of you know, just putting together simulations, right? Of how, what would happen if this state did this? And what would happen if this state did this? Nate Silver in, uh, in, in 2016 basically said that it was a 66% chance that uh, Hillary Clinton would win and that Trump had a 33% chance. And then, and then there were others, it was 70, 30 and 80, 20, and it was all over the place. Nate Silver has the same prediction right now um, with regard to Biden winning. Uh, 69 is, a, you know, it's about two to one, about the same as it was. Um, which means that Trump has a three in 10 chance of winning and Biden has about a seven in chance, 10 chance of winning. And why, do, why is that? Well, that's a, a lot of that is those toss up scenarios that I talked about. It's also the fact that there's a, there's been a move in sentiment, at least perception. And this is, I, I never encourage gambling in my classes, but this is a, a, a market where you can go bet. Yes, you could use your real money to bet on presidential elections. And what we've seen in the last month is actually an increase in sentiment that Trump is going to win the presidential election. Now, that has not translated necessarily into polling. That has not translated into, even in a lot of those competitive states, they still look like they lean toward Biden. But there's this... 2016 is coming, is going to happen again. The Republicans are hold, holding on out, holding that hope out that Trump can pull it off in those same states. Um, at least, you know, at least those yellow states that I pointed out, which would be a very, very close, contentious, awful, like, can you imagine with all the trust issues and everything that's going on in our electorate right now, how tough that's going to be. Um, I've got one more slide and then I will, I will punt. Um, actually, two more. Uh, so there's also the Senate races and the House races. I'll, I'll skip the House races for now because I'm going long. Um, but I do want to point, go to the next slide and talk about the Senate races a little bit. Um, no, one more, go ahead. So there are, the Senate races are very interesting um, because it gets to Matt's point about what happens in the next, in the, after this election. And What's go if if you do say that Biden is likely to win and the Dem the Democrats are likely to hold on to the House of Representatives and probably gain a few seats, the question is what's going to happen with the Senate with regard to the Supreme Court with regard to those sorts of things. And right now, it's actually somewhat out of we're not really sure um, because if you do your math there really quickly, um, there are three or four elections that are yellow that are toss ups. North Carolina, Iowa, Maine, probably next on that list would be Montana um, that could possibly go to Democrats. Um, so the, the biggest margin that could probably come out of this is 5248 for the Democrats. What's likely is 5149 if, they, if the Democrats get all three of these toss-ups. Um, you'll note that if you're, if you're interested in Colorado, uh, the latest poll has Hickenlooper uh, over Gardner by nine points. Uh, that's down from what it was. There were some, there's been a six point poll. There's been a 17 point poll and an 18 point poll in the last four. Um, I think we're, you know, nine, 10 points sounds right, but I expect that will tighten because Gardner has such a campaign finance advantage um, over the next few weeks. But I, again, I, 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 it's gonna be very difficult for Gardner to make up much more ground. And with that, I am very long. So I will stop there because that's my punchline anyway. No, that is wonderful. I just want to give one more round of applause to all three of you. I don't know how everyone else is feeling, but if it's nervous, excitement, I, I feel like I have a mix of all the emotions right now. Lots of, lots of good stuff in the next 63 days. 
I'm going to give you three a quick break from talking. Um, you all may have noticed I pulled another panelist on the screen. Brian from New Era, Colorado is going to quickly talk about voter activation on campus. If you need to update your voter registration, um, all of those good things. And then we will address just a couple of your questions. If you have more questions, continue to pop those in the chat. I saw some really good ones coming in. Um, but with that, I will hand it over to you, Brian. Awesome. Thank you so much, Alexandra, for having me tonight. And thank you to everyone for making time for this. Um, for those of you who don't know, New Era is a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization. It's local here to Colorado. We are um, a certified voter registration drive with the Secretary of State, and we are the best, best there is as far as getting young people engaged in democracy. We, a little bit of history, we started in 2006. We've been on CSU's campus since 2010, so this will be our 10 year anniversary of being part of the CSU community. And as you all can imagine and very well know, uh, organizing looks a lot different this year as opposed to past years, and even just getting in contact with people looks a lot different than it has in previous years. So with that, we do still have our in-person options, but we also have moved a little bit more to digitally organizing. Perfect. Yes. So for our in-field, we have, these are not on CSU's campus, so I'll say that up front to start with, but other organizing groups around, this is still new era, but around the state. We have plexiglass set up at our tables. For tabling on CSU's campus, they actually require that you follow a bunch of protocols, including only two people on campus, but we do have masks. So if people on campus for some reason are not wearing a mask and they still wanna interact with us and get registered to vote, um, we do have them provided and we are sanitizing on the clipboards in between uses and doing everything we can to try to maintain safe social distancing protocol and making sure that we're meeting people where they're at. Um, we do still, for, yeah, for the next slide, we do still have um, online, and we can do, in the past we've done in-person class wraps, which is just our term for where we go into a classroom if a professor invites us, and we are registering a bunch of students. It's really easy and really handy. That way everyone's in the same spot, and if people have the same questions, they can all have them answered at the same time. Um, but we do now offer that virtually. So if professors are interested in inviting us to their Zoom classes or if they want us to host a Zoom call to get their students registered, we are able to do that. I put up a few slides from our, our presentation that we walked through with students just so people have an idea. Actually, could you go back one? Sorry. Um, so if for registering for the first time, this is where it gets a little bit dicey with some of, some of Colorado's registration laws. Colorado, first of all, is an excellent state as far as access to elections countrywide, but there are still a couple of nuances that make the move to virtual a little bit more tricky. If you've been issued a Colorado license, you have to use that to register to vote for the first time. Um, even if it's lost, if it's expired, if you've been issued one, you have to use it, which can get a little bit tricky right now with DMV requiring appointment. Um, as long as you have the 4D customer identifier number, as it says, so if you have a picture of it, that is fine. If you've never been registered in Colorado, or if you've never used a Colorado, been issued a Colorado ID, you can use the last four of your social security number. The problem that causes though is you can't do that online and so especially for younger students incoming freshmen a lot of the folks who are on campus right now they if they are coming from out of state and they don't have a colorado license they can't register online for the first time if you're updating a registration you can you can use the last four of your social security number if you've been registered in the state before and you're just you've moved to a new address but that's one of the drawbacks and one of the barriers that people face. And so we're really trying to make a push for still having those in-person options on campus because not everyone has access to a printer and not everyone is, of course, going to take the time to do that if it's a large inconvenience to them. Sweet. This is our registration website. Um, it's registerincolorado.org. I realize it's not on the slide, so. I can pop that in the chat in a little bit. Um, and then if you want to move on to the next slide, if, um, 
we're in person, we usually do what we call a pledge to vote card. And that's our way because we don't just want to get people registered, we also want to turn them out to vote. And so a pledge to vote card is a little postcard that uh, registrants registrant go out so that it actually gets mailed to themselves with their own writing saying like, hey, you pledged to vote. Since we are registering people online, this is our digital version of that, just so we can actually get in contact with those people who we've registered to vote and be like, hey, just a reminder, the election is coming up. And then this links to the Secretary of State website on the next slide. Thanks so much for moving the slides for me. I really appreciate it. <laughs> um, and then we go through step by step when we're doing this in person, of course, or we try to get screenshots of all the pages on the Secretary of State website just to make sure that we can very easily talk through students. Um, since if we're not there in person, it's a little bit harder to communicate, of course, and see specifically what they're looking at. So trying to get people to go through step by step. Um, and yeah, if you want to go ahead on to the next one, I think I was going before that. Oh, oh no. okay. Well, there must be one missing. I'm so sorry. Um, I, if you are very interested in getting involved with New Era Colorado, um, we do have organizing opportunities. We have phone banking, text banking, talking to your communicate uh, community. We also do have those in-person field organizing opportunities if anyone is interested. Um, if anyone is interested in getting their class signed up for either an in-person or virtual class wrap, we would love to do that. And um, yeah, my email is there. Please send me an email. I also realize I'm probably over. So thank you again so much for your time. Really appreciate it. Awesome. Thank you, Brian. Um, I just want to give a round of applause first off to everyone for attending tonight. I see that the chat box is just lighting up. Um, so thank you to Robert, Kyle, and Matt for already starting to answer those questions. We do have about five more minutes, so continue to keep questions coming. I'll kind of default to Kyle, Matthew, and Robert to answer um, the ones they would like to answer, knowing that five minutes is quick. I also just want to quickly say one more thank you to the CSU Alumni Association members in the group. Um, your membership really does allow us to put on programming like this, as well as the College of Liberal Arts. Um, I'm biased, I'm a liberal arts alum, but I truly think the faculty are unlike any anywhere else across the university. So thank you, Kyle, thank, thank you, Matthew, and thank you, Robert. Um, continue to send your questions our way. We'll answer them for the next five or so minutes. And then if you'd like to continue to engage with the Alumni Association, alumni.colostate.edu is where you can find a full calendar of virtual programs. So thank you all again, and I will turn it back over to the experts. Yeah, thank you so much, Alexander. So I actually want to address, there's been a thread in a couple of the questions going on about uh, the Electoral College, um, thinking about, um, you know, the, the influence of the popular vote for the Electoral College. Is the Electoral College um, a vestige of systemic racism? Obviously, the noxious, morally indefensible three-fifths compromise um, It's not just systemic racism, it's overt and institutional, every kind of racism. Um, but I think there's sort of a broader point that I'd like to make. There's, there's a, a really rather fundamental disagreement in political sort of thought and behavior in this country about what is the thing that the federal government ought to be representing? Is it citizens or is it states, right? Are the states sovereign republics represented by a central government? If so, then Kyle's point about, well, yes, in a contested election, every state should have an equal vote in the House of Representatives for who becomes the president. Each state should have equal representation in the Senate because states are the thing being represented, right? This was the, uh, the view of smaller states at the Constitutional Convention. And there's the view that no, states are just geographic entities, right? Citizens are the thing that are to be represented. So we should do things proportional exactly to population. And a office like president that is national, uh, a vote in Wyoming should not to count the same as a vote in Texas. And that makes sense if you ascribe to that first view that citizens are the thing that the federal government represents as opposed to uh, sort of uh, middle, middle uh, intermediary sovereign republic of the individual states. And so that's just some food for thought that's really more of a philosophical and a values question for a lot of folks. 
and a lot of that goes back and Robert can speak to this better than I can, but I mean, when at the founding of the country, the states were the fundamental unit, right? And they were coming together, trying to find that compromise. That's the whole Senate House compromise, right? Uh, the House is based on population. The Senate is based on state representation. And so that made its way into the policy documents of our, of our country and in a lot of different ways that are somewhat anachronistic to the way we think today. But changing those has proven difficult because those interests that have overrepresentation like that, and they want to maintain that. And so how do, how do we change that other than through democratic means and or other, there are other workarounds. I mentioned the, the National Popular Vote Compact and there are other aspects of, and policy moves that are out there, um, but it's very difficult and it, it's proven very hard to change. And that's not to say that it won't and that it can't. It just could require a constitutional amendment. It could require all sorts of um, different pieces that, that have to be changed. And even then it will go under constitutional challenge. So. Yeah, and just a little bit more. Um, at the time of the, <clears throat> excuse me, the American Revolution, people who lived in the United States were more fundamentally linked to their colony and then their state than what became the federal government. And in fact, our first form of government was the Articles of Confederation. It had one House of Congress and in it, you, they voted by state, they didn't vote by individual. And so that state attachment is very, very strong and has deep historic roots. Awesome. And on that note, I know we're right at the 630 mark. Um, so just one last thank you, honestly, truly, fully. It was so great to spend the night with each of you. Um, we will include the recording from this presentation as well as a follow-up survey. The survey is always optional, but I saw a couple of comments asking for more of things like this. Much of our programming is based off of direct feedback from alums. So if you have ideas for other topics you'd like to see, other departments we should engage with, please do feel empowered to fill out that survey. Um, but with that, a huge thank you, Kyle, Matthew, Robert, and Brian. We couldn't have done it without you. Hope you all have a wonderful night and go Rams. Cheers. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, y'all. Good night.